Let us for a few moments concentrate on the Divine Master and pray for the welfare of the whole humanity. Shanti 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 Hari Om Dutsat Om Stapaka Yajada Masya Sarvadharma Swarupine Tāpakāya jadharmasya sarvadharma svarupine avadāra varishtāya Rāma Krishnā yate nama asato māsadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotergamaya Om Shanti 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 Let us bow down to Sri Ramakrishna the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. I have been talking about the Ramakrishna ideal and today also I am speaking on the same subject how Sri Ramakrishna is present as the ideal his life and teachings are setting the ideal for us. We have to study thoroughly his life and works. How he was very particular in following the spiritual disciplines and how he was a source of inspiration to all types of aspirants belonging to different religions and different sects. So he is a central figure giving inspiration to all the spiritual seekers giving them hope of assurance and encouraging them to practice spiritual life. It is true, it is very hard life. It is hard because you have to constantly fight with your internal enemies. Lust, greed, anger, jealousy, hatred. Sri Ramakrishna compares them as six alligators, Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Madha, Matsarya. I would like to name them as six demons. (laughs) They are really demons. One demon itself is enough to rob everything of us, what to speak of, six demons living in our heart. Well, that's the game you have to play. You have come here to play the game and you have to struggle. You have to struggle. Everyone has to struggle. No exception. 
So you have to understand every step, every word what I am telling is of utmost importance. Without struggling, you won't achieve the spiritual illumination. So how you struggle, that is important. In what manner you should struggle, under what guidance you will struggle, all these steps are very important. Step one, step two, you have to follow, step by step. But you have to be determined to do that, otherwise you can't give fight. If you have to fight, you must be a good soldier. You must fulfill all the qualities of the soldier. Namby-pamby attitude will not work in spiritual life. It won't. <laughs> but don't get depressed. At times we feel tremendous crisis in our spiritual life. We feel as if we have not progressed. But that's not the fact. The fact is you are not giving the fight properly. Admit the fault, admit your weakness. It's worth struggling. Without struggling you won't get real happiness or real peace in this world. From the start of the creation up to this time, Every day, I am telling you from the start of creation up to this day, every day people are being killed, people are suffering. There is poverty, there is wealth, everything going side by side. There is joy and sorrow going alternately. Everything is going in a parallel way. Everyone ha is passing through these things. That's the game. Otherwise, why should you call it a game, if nothing is to be done? And somebody was uh, remarking, where it is? I have been to Houston probably, there somebody uh, talked. Not Houston, in Ganges. <laughs> <laughs> Ganges, last time I had gone there, my usual visit, Thursday went, Friday came back. At that particular day, one uh, person had come to attend the retreat, women's retreat. She has come from Miami, Florida. She recollected, she remembered I had gone to her house and uh, had conducted satsang in her home. She came and talked to Swamiji, did you remember, you came to my house, etc. After some time I could recollect, immediately I could not recollect, but after some time I remembered the whole thing. In fact, in the year 1991 I came here, I think in 1992 or so, 92 or 93, I had been to Miami, at the, probably 92. Uh, there was a group, Vedanta group, and they had uh, he invited me and the program was arranged in her home. She had invited all the people, about 60-70 people were there, I conducted bhajans and uh, gave a talk. And this lady, I even quoted what she asked me. I remembered everything, but initial remembering was necessary for me, I could not <laughs> recollect. And then I, she was a lady who came and asked me, Swamiji, I am interested in spiritual life. Can you initiate? Then I told her, no, I can't initiate because Swamiji is already here. Swami Bhashan is was still alive. And uh, if I have to initiate, it will take some more time. But if you are deeply interested in uh, taking up spiritual paths, why can't you go to India and take initiation in Bilurmat? No, I did not suggest her to come here take initiation because Bhashanji was not keeping well. He could not even speak. And uh, what type of initiation they would get? 
Swamiji cannot speak. You must know you are uh, handling the life of a person. It should be taken very seriously. Spiritual life is is very precious. So she did it. She went to India. She met the present Maharaj, the late President Bhuteshwaranda Ji. He took initiation from him. Then she narrated. She took initiation. Then I. She was very happy. I could remember everything, all the details, and she was telling. Of course, she was living in a very good home, beautiful house, and she has two children, bright children, very bright. Everything is okay, but she is telling Swamiji, my husband is not believing in God. Now. He is telling. In fact, he is he is planning to write a book on that subject. Then I asked him why. What made him to disbelieve God? Then she said, "Oh, she he was telling what is happening in the Yugoslavia war, Bosnia war, this that war. What has that to do with?" God. Oh, anyway, Swamiji, you should speak to him. I will bring him one day to you. you. Bring him. I am ready to talk to him. But you must be open-minded. Then I can talk. Don't come with preconceived idea, or don't come with arrogance or egoism. You will understand everything. We are not without reason. we are we want to be reasonable we want to have a rational approach tell me when the war was not being held even during lord krishna's time mahabharata war was there even shri ramachandra's time rama himself had to give a fight and kill those demons tell me one instance where there was no war war will be there as long as the conflicts are there conflicts do exist as long as multiplicity uh, of uh, beings different people thinking in different way clashing is a uh, the three gunas in disparity sattva rajas tamas is the play of the gunas clashing that's all permutation combination Whether you believe God or don't believe God, you are not going to teach God a lesson. <laughs> On the other hand, you will be taught a lesson. Finally, well, it's another kind of I should say arrogance, thinking about his own intelligence and thinking I am more intelligent than God Himself. If he God forbid, if by chance he comes into some kind of crisis, then who will help him? Anyway, I, sh- I will not wish any bad thing for him, because his wife is a good devotee, and even if he has got that kind of uh, atheistic view, he is also child of God. So I pray for. That's why I am always telling, pray for the welfare of all human beings. This is the best form of prayer. Sarve is Rāsu kino bhavantu, Sarve santu nirāmaya ha, Sarve badrāni pushyantu maa kashti dukkha bhāg bhavet. It's a beautiful verse in Sanskrit. Well, Sri Rāmakṣṇa has come in this present age. He lived the life and he set the ideal. His life itself is an ideal. But as I said, you must be a good soldier. If you are weak in in your limbs, if you are not strong enough, you can't give a fight. Probably you have to take another life to become a good soldier. Without fight, you can't have any achievement. That's the important point which you should remember. You don't have to blame anybody. 
if you are very anxious to blame blame yourself so that is my introduction for my today's talk <laughs> so shri ramakrishna was utterly free from affectation and show of saintliness till the end of his life how did he live he remained a child of the divine mother read the gospel from page to page till the last end of the page every page there's a word oh mother how many times he has prayed and prayed and prayed till the last breath of his life he has prayed oh mother that means he had tremendous faith called absolute faith absolute trust in divine mother not simply talking we talk and uh, uh, be in a different way no there is no trace of hypocrisy in shri ramakrishna's personality so if you have to go forward in your spiritual path you must never be hypocrite means what suppose you commit some mistakes be bold enough be truthful to accept that then you'll not be charged with hypocrisy yes i have done a mistake oh lord forgive me wonderful god forgives undoubtedly he forgives if he is not having that quality of forgiveness probably would not have lived at all we deserve nothing to live <laughs> he has committed so many things unpleasant things unwanted things we don't deserve to live also but in spite of it we are living why because of the forgiveness of god he is forgiving us that's the point so whenever any difficulty or any doubt confronted shri ramakrishna what he would so what he would do he would immediately go to mother and he would go and talk as we are talking together here he would go and speak to her about the problems that means he was so guileless his guilelessness and trust came from the complete absence of egoism and from his total attunement to the infinite that's very important point see how he has given the ideal here perfect guilelessness that is the ideal do you want to follow spiritual path take this one your life is blessed one line be guileless how could he be so guileless because he was free from the trace of egoism nirahankara nirmamo bhutva lord krishna says in the bhagavad gita nirahankara be free from egoism if you have to be called as a devotee don't simply label i am a great devotee and go and stand in a marketplace and declare you are a devotee who cares for that you have to make god understand you properly god will understand you only when you are free from ahankar that is egoism the swayed lord krishna says very emphatically you have to become nirahankara you must be free from egoism once shri ramakrishna said in the gospel it is recorded why do i become impatient when i am ill sometimes she would shri ramakrishna would become restless on account of the illness of the body that is he would behave like any ordinary being 
and Sri Ramakrishna himself gives the answer for that. The answer was, because the mother has placed me in the state of a child, I am restless. The child depends entirely on its mother. The child of the maid servant, he gives the example, when he quarrels with the child of the mother, master, when the child of the maid servant quarrels with the child of the master, he says, I shall tell my mother. And Sri Ramakrishna, see again how he is setting the ideal for us. One must have childlike faith and the intense yearning that a child feels to see its mother. That yearning is like the red sky in the east at dawn. After such a sky, the sun must rise. Immediately after that yearning, one sees God. So, childlike faith and the intense yearning that a child fails to, eat, to see its mother. When that yearning came, when that yearning comes, he is not bothered by anything else. That's a very important point. That means, sometimes, you know, I have seen mother and child, I always watch, when the mother comes with a child, I love to watch them. They should not know I am watching. Then I can enjoy better. The way how mother behaves, the way how child behaves, astonishing. It is, even observation gives me happiness. It is so, it is so touching. The child is playing, in fact this is what I saw, I am telling you. The child was playing with a toy. For a while, then it became fed up with that and it threw away the toy and began to cry. Ma, 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 like that. And mother was there. She wanted her child to play further more. <laughs> so what she did was, she threw another toy. She took up another toy and threw it before the child so that he can play with that new toy. Do you know what the child did? He took the new toy and threw it away and cried with a double uh, intensity. <laughs> that means the child is expressing that he doesn't want any toys anymore. He wants the mother. You come. I want you, not the toys. There's a message. And mother understood it. She came and took the child on her lap. That's it. That is the meaning of renunciation. Don't say, renunciation simply will not come uh, simply by thinking or by talking. <laughs> renunciation comes when you are disgusted, when you are fed up with the world. Nonsense. What is this I am doing? It's utter stupidity to be entangled in this kind of worldliness and worldly things and worldly activities and losing everything of myself. That state is not so easy to get. That is one way of getting into renunciation. Another way of getting into renunciation is coming in contact with holy people and following certain disciplines in life, one can practice that ideal of renunciation in one's life. So, here again Sri Ramakrishna is giving an ideal. He himself was childlike. He himself was yearning intensely to see Divine Mother. He didn't want anything else but the vision of the Mother. And he is telling, look, set your mind like this. You must have the vision of God. You must have spiritual illumination. That's true. Now I'm st I'm over I'm overwhelmingly uh, thrilled 
to go deep into the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. How every word has tremendous significance and how Sri Ramakrishna in every action he is setting ideal for us. That is the purpose of my talking, Ramakrishna ideal. I am trying to elaborate this as much as I can. Here is a, the best spiritual essence is there. You don't have to run after. So, and Sri Ramakrishna again gives another example, through examples, how he makes the point very clear. That also comes in the gospel. I am taking the gospel teachings and just trying to uh, elaborate the point. There is a boy named Jatila. That boy should have to go to the school. He had to walk quite a few miles probably. He had to pass through the woods to reach the school. Child, you know, naturally the child was afraid because the wild animals are there in the woods. Any time they might come and attack. They may not come. They may not attack. But the boy had that natural fear. So, uh, he expressed that fear to his mother. Oh mother, I am going daily to the school, but I am full of fear when I pass through the woods. I am terribly frightened. Then the mother replied, Why? Why should you be afraid? Don't be afraid. Call Madhusudan. He will come. He is your elder brother. He will remove all your fear. Just, she said, and because this child had tremendous love and affection towards its mother, it believed what the mother said. There is no question of doubt there. That is very important point. The doubt comes means it destroys the result. Doubt should not come. Doubt will not come if you are guileless. If you have tremendous faith and belief. And this child has naturally all those qualities. And when the mother said, Don't worry, when you, when you are passing through the wood, you call on Madhusudan, he will come and take you to the school. And the boy literally believed what mother said. And when he passed through the woods, he called loudly the name of Madhusudan. But immediately the Madhusudan did not come. Then he began to cry, cry, cry. What? You are not responding to me. If you don't come, I can't go to the school. And finally, Madhusudan came and spoke to him very tenderly. Why are you afraid? Don't be afraid. I will take you to the school. Come. That Madhusudan was God Himself. So, guilelessness and free from egoism and complete faith in the Divine Mother made Sri Ramakrishna's life a spontaneous expression of the harmony, goodness and bliss of Divine Life. Through His utter simplicity, Sri Ramakrishna teaches the modern people who are sophisticated how to recover the vitality and spontaneity of human life and how to live in tune with the rhythms of cosmic existence. So, in order to set your ideal very clearly, you have to thoroughly meditate upon the character of Sri Ramakrishna. Humility was another noble quality of Sri Ramakrishna. He subdued the vanity and arrogance of people by his humility.
even when learned pandits had declared shri ramakrishna to be an incarnation and even many people had started worshiping him shri ramakrishna continued to be his humble old self he never forgot to show respect where it was due he never hesitated to learn lessons from others or to acknowledge the source of his teaching or illustration once a devotee was saying he used the phrase i know immediately shri ramakrishna scolded him and asked him not to say that again however his humility was not mere polite manners and was the very antithesis of the false humility which looks upon as a worthless sinner his humility was this spontaneous expression of his realization of immense immanence of god in all people and the differences in the degree of divine power manifested in different people two more remarkable traits of shri ramakrishna's personality we should observe to impress upon us how remarkable shri ramakrishna ideal one is the extraordinary range and depth of his mind and the other is the astonishing emotional intensity he was capable of within its invisible walls his mind held the utmost limits of jnana and bhakti ever reached by any one on earth he scaled the highest peaks of yoga and he thoroughly investigated the abysmal depths of the tantras devotional scriptures speak of the five attitudes towards god one is shanta swabhava the calm attitude the second one dasya swabhava the attitude of a servant the third one sakya swabhava the attitude of a friend the fourth one vatsalya swabhava the attitude of a mother and the last one madhura swabhava the attitude of a bride when people take to devotional practices most of them attempt only one of these attitudes but when you come to shri ramakrishna's life you find he cultivated all these five moods to their perfection the intensity with which he did this is unprecedented in the history of lives and writings of saints these devotional moods passed through him like tidal waves he could identify himself totally with each mood and work it up to the highest possible level the world has never seen such intensity of spiritual endeavor achieved at such a stupendously vast scale the another significance of shri ramakrishna ideal is the universality and practicality of the ideal that's also very important for us to note mere perfection in virtues is not enough to make a person a universal ideal two more qualifications are necessary for this one is 
that his life must have a universal dimension. It must serve as an example to people of diverse beliefs. Among the beliefs of mankind, the strongest are religious beliefs. Every religion and every sect has its own set of beliefs. These beliefs derive their authority from certain fundamental spiritual truths pertaining to God and the soul. The true spirit of Islam, the true spirit of Christianity, the true spirit of Vaishnavism or Hinduism can be understood only by directly realizing the spiritual truths each stands for. For this one must practice its spiritual disciplines. This was what Sri Ramakrishna did. He followed Islam, Islamic disciplines, got the realization. Again, he followed the Christian doctrines and he got the vision of Lord Christ. A person who merely shows sympathy or tolerance towards a religion or sect will not be acceptable to its members as an ideal. Only a person who sincerely believes its truths and has gained a living experience of this will be acceptable to them. Since Sri Ramakrishna practiced the disciplines and realized the truths of different religions and sects, his life gains the status of a universal ideal because he is speaking as an authority. He is speaking from the experience of his own realization. He knew what exactly Islam teaches and he knew exactly what Christianity teaches. And he knew very exactly how these various religions lead to the same goal. The other qualification for an ideal man is that his way of life must be practicable for a large number of people. Suppose there is a person who is a Raja Yogi, who, who is adept in controlling his breath and following all the strict disciplines, following the strict diet, etc. He might have become illumined soul, but large number of people cannot follow his ideal because large number of people are not of the same temperament. They don't have same capacity to practice those strict disciplines and they feel frustrated when they come to know how difficult at the same time dangerous if they slip from the discipline. So, the other qualification for an ideal man is that his way of life must be practicable for a large number of people. In all religions which recognize monasticism, the monk stands for the highest ideal and is accorded great veneration. It's true, wherever you go, if they know he's a monk, they give due respect. Because they know how difficult it is to practice monasticism. According to tradition, the sannyasin is freed from all social obligations and conventions and generally, usually leads a secluded life. A monk. Evidently, all people cannot take up that. All people cannot go to seclusion. With all their mind filled up with desires, unfulfilled and partly fulfilled, 
with so many conflicts in the mind with so many tensions worries and involvements you can't expect him to go to secular place and uh, spend this life in spiritual way no even though you go there all these monkeys will follow there also so a holy person who sits alone in a cave or wanders like a rhinoceros may be a paragon of perfection but the majority of the people the vast majority cannot follow his ways it's too difficult for them people in modern times put a premium on work and social life that's very important for them if you tell spiritual practice keeping them then they appreciate they love it yes we can also do it has become difficult for the people to follow traditional forms of monasticism and they are seeking an alternative way of spiritual life that's why we see in the gospel many times uh, people of various temperament they come and they keep on asking is there no way as is there no way for us we are householders we are entangled in so many things is there no way way for us and shri ram krishna would always encourage them there is a way there is a way and he would show the way and he could show the way because he lived the life and he knew what it is he knew the difficulties of the people who have been involved in this worldly things and he is very considerate and as i said earlier forgiving beautiful quality forgiving it's a divine quality it's a spiritual quality everyone should develop that we immediately run after punishing a person we jump even hastily to punish the person before we could think otherwise no don't jump like that think for a while before punishing a person think for a while has that attitude of forgiveness that forgiveness attitude comes only when you have genuine love genuine love poor fellow is suffering he is weak so he committed that oh god please protect him remove that weakness from him that's the way we should pray now shri ramakrishna was ordained sanyasin he got the initiation from totapuri and he became a monk he could have definitely followed the traditional path of sanyas had he so wished he could have easily avoided his early marriage but he chose to honor the sanctity of wedlock without lowering the ideal of sanyas thereby this is a very important point very important point he is not only householder but a monk what a rare combination rare combination in effect this meant a synthesis of the two ways of life synthesis monastic and lay see how shri ram is putting the ideal in front of us he is showing the mirror to us we don't even see the mirror simply we clump we are not seeing we are not see the mirror you will see everything so shri ram krishna is like the mirror he has set the ideal for us take up the ideal so modern person which eliminates the seclusion and rigidity of monasticism as well as the lust and greed and attachment which characterize the householder's life 
On the other hand, the, this ideal combines the purity, renunciation and discipline of monasticism with the flexibility and social commitment of the householder's life. Well, this ideal has been presented to us in the life of Sri Ramakrishna. Well, it is not completely a new ideal. It is partly a revival of the ancient Hindu ideal of the Rishi. A Rishi was exactly like what Sri Ramakrishna represented in modern times. Rishi, all the Rishis were householders. But all the Rishis were great tapasvis. Great tapasvis. There is one uh, incident, just I am telling you, there is a Rishi who had told his wife that he will be going to meditation and he will not return immediately. He will be there probably for some years in seclusion. He makes all this statement. Then he said, well, in spite of that, if you are urgently in need of me for some reason, you just think of me, I will come. See? That is Rishi's life. They could live the strict monastic life, at the same time, they could live with the wife also. In fact, at one point of time, she wanted him. She sat through and thought of her husband, who told that he would come if she remembered him. Immediately he came. Well, what made you to call me? And she expressed her desire that she should have a child. Okay, the story goes, why she, why she desired a child, etc. I don't want to go to the story part of it. I am just <laughs> coming to the only relevant point which I am interested into in uh, pointing out. Well, the illumined teachers, we meet in the Vedas, all the Vedas, nowadays uh, these Vedic uh, revelations are available in book form. Every hymn has got a Rishi. There is a revelation the Rishi experienced in his meditation. Vedas are nothing but the collection of the revelations of the Rishis. They were all illumined teachers, Upanishads and Puranas. Everywhere we find one Rishi uh, talking to another and spreading the spiritual ideas. Though sannyas as the fourth stage of life might have been recognized even during the Vedic period, its institutionalization and rise in popularity took place after Buddha and Shankara. It was not very popular. It cannot be. It cannot be popular and you can't expect uh, the people to renounce everything and take a monastic life. The present indications are that though traditional monasticism may continue to flourish as a core of religion, as it should be. Core of religion. The Rishi ideal may become the dominant ideal of the present age. That's true. In fact, to set forth that ideal, Sri Ramakrishna has come. Swami Vivekananda has said in one of his complete works, volume number three, he says, in his talk he says there, we had hundreds of rishis in ancient India. 
the Swami Vivekananda's words. We will have millions. We will have millions. We are going to have. And the sooner every one of us believes in this, the better for India and the better for the world. Sri Ramakrishna did not merely revive the ancient way of life, but adapted it to suit the needs of modern man and woman and also changed its meaning and scope. I would love to take up the same topic in my next Tuesday class also. Thank you. Chant the name of the Lord and His glory unceasingly. The mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire, worldly lust, raging furiously within. O name, stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart. Open its curb to knowledge of thyself. O self, drown deep in the waves of his bliss, tasting his nectar at every step, bathing in his name that bought for weary souls. Various are thy names, O Lord. In each and every name thy power resides. No times are set, no rites are needful for chanting of thy name. So vast is thy mercy, how huge then is my wretchedness, who find in its empty life and heart no devotion to thy name. O my mind, be humbler than a blade of grass, be patient and forbearing like a tree, take no honor to thyself, give honor to all, chant unceasingly the name of the Lord. O Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or retinue, the playthings of lust or the toys of fame, as many times as I may be reborn, grant me, O Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one, in thy mercy, consider him as dust beneath thy feet. Oh, how I long for the day when an instant separation from thee, O Lord, will be as a thousand years. When my heart burns away with its desire, and the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrated thy feet, let me be in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it tears my soul asunder. O thou who stealest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers, may all realize what is good, may all be actuated by noble thoughts, may all rejoice everywhere, may all be happy, may all be free from disease, May all realize what is good, may none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous, may the virtuous attain tranquility, may the tranquil be free from bonds, may the freed make others free. May good betide all people, may the sovereign righteously rule the earth, may all beings ever attain what is good, may the whole, may the whole, may the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour rain in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be free from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord, the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied. For he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe is satisfied. <laughs>